Do you take a seat? Good afternoon. If you're new with us, um, just a quick introduction. My name is Lewis, and uh, I am uh, on staff here at church and uh, part of the kind of wider group of people that uh, help lead the church. So it's wonderful to see you here. If this is your first time, just as Johnny and Hope said, uh, an especially warm welcome to you. Um, Last week marked a year since the January 6th riots at the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. And uh, on that date last year, there was a crowd of angry uh, protesters, voters, who felt that the election had been fraudulent and they stormed uh, on the government building. And um, the reaction to that event was so overwhelmingly strong. I think that's me. Because... um, it felt like a threat to the very kind of fabric of what makes America a democracy. At the heart of it was this kind of a threat to what they call a peaceful transition of power. So that when one president loses an election to another, they're expected just to hand over the reins uh, with no struggle. But in many cultures in the past, and even today, that kind of change of leadership isn't as easy as that. It's often a very kind of difficult, tumultuous time And um, one of the reasons that January the 6th last year was so shocking to so many people was that it felt like a kind of blast from the past uh, when sheer violence was what it meant to be powerful. When rather than winning an election by popular vote, actually the strongest person won. That's what it felt like for many people. That's why it was so shocking. The peaceful transition of power was upset. And uh, today we're back in First and Second Samuel. We've taken a break for Christmas and New Year. And where we left off, uh, Saul, who had been the king over Israel, has just died. He's just fallen on his own sword. And David is now kind of starting to pick up the reins a little bit. And what we're going to see together is this question, of how will David respond to this transition in power? Well, we see something of the kind of blast from the past where it's sheer power uh, that wins somebody um, their place. Or will we see a new kind of leadership? Today, we're just going to see in 2 Samuel 1 and then a bit of 2 that David's initial days as the kind of up-and-coming ruler of Judah, they show us something brilliant of what real power is of what real gospel leadership is in the way of Jesus. So we're just going to work through 2 Samuel 1 and a bit of 2, and we're going to pull out some key threads from the way that David leads. So before we read the passage, here's where we're going to go. We'll say that true power is abundance, true power is humility, and true power is love. If you you have a Bible with you, uh, do flick to 2 Samuel chapter 1, and uh, we'll read together starting in verse 17. It says this, David sang the following lament for Saul and his son, Jonathan. And he ordered that the Judahites be taught the song of the bow. It is written in the book of Jashar. The splendor of Israel lies slain on your heights, how the mighty have fallen. Do not tell it in Gath. Don't announce it in the marketplaces of Ashkelon or the daughters of the Philistines will rejoice and the daughters of the uncircumcised will celebrate. Mountains of Gilboa, let no dew or rain be on you or fields of offerings, for there the shield of the mighty was defiled, the shield of Saul, no longer anointed with oil. Jonathan's bow never retreated, Saul's sword never returned unstained from the blood of the slain, from the flesh of the mighty. Saul and Jonathan loved and delightful. They were not parted in life or in death. They were swifter than eagles, stronger than lions. Daughters of Israel, weep for Saul, who clothed you in scarlet with luxurious things, who decked your garments with gold ornaments. How the mighty have fallen in the thick of battle. Jonathan lies slain on your heights. I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. You were such a friend to me. Your love for me was more wondrous than the love of women. How the mighty have fallen and the weapons of war have perished. Sometime later, David inquired of the Lord, should I go to one of the towns of Judah? And the Lord answered him, go. Then David asked, where should I go? And the Lord replied to Hebron. 
So David went there with his two wives, Ahinoam the, Je- the Jezreelite, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal the Carmelite. In addition, David brought the men who were with him, each one with his family, and they settled in the towns near Hebron. Then the men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. They told David, it was the men of Jabesh Gilead who buried Saul. So David sent messengers to the men of Jabesh Gilead and said to them, the Lord bless you, because you have shown this kindness to Saul, your Lord, when you buried him. Now may the Lord show kindness and faithfulness to you, and I will also show the same goodness to you, because you have done this deed. Therefore be strong and valiant, for though Saul, your Lord, is dead, the house of Judah has anointed me king over them. Well, the first thing we want to see from David's, uh, the beginnings of David's leadership is that true power is abundance. Now in his famous book, The Seven habits of highly effective people. Stephen Covey speaks about two types of people, people who have a scarcity mentality and those who have an abundance mentality. What he means by that is that there's two different ways of relating to the world. Either you view resources as scarce and therefore you hoard them and you're greedy and you're jealous, or you consider the world to be abundant with enough to go around. You could think of it this way. If you were lost in the desert with one bottle of water and a friend, you would savor every single drop. You'd be so hesitant to give even one drop away because you don't know when the next drink is coming. The water is scarce. If you were lost on a hike through the woods and you came across a kind of crystal clear stream, you would fill up your bottle, you would drink it, you would fill it up again, you would give it to your friend, you would have a few bottles each. You wouldn't feel worried about running out of water because the stream is there. It's not running out. The water is abundant. So that's the difference between a scarcity mentality and an abundance mentality. The first aspect of David's leadership that we want to see is that he has an abundance mentality. Have a look with me at his song of lament for Saul and Jonathan in chapter 1. From verse 23, he says something like this, that they were loved and delightful. They were strong and fast. He tells Israel to weep for Saul because he brought goodness to their nation. That he stands in front of a country and he praises them out loud. Just remember that David is singing, if you know the story, about his political opponent here. David and Saul did not always get on. You could forgive, you could forgive David for standing at this moment and saying the only thing between me and power is now dead. You could forgive him a kind of token gesture, right? Like we see this all the time in politics, a kind of, yes, so-and-so was great, but, and then a list of our own achievements, a list of what that, the person who's coming into power will do. Even in our everyday lives, our temptation is to downplay the achievements and the gifts and the goodness of others. Because we have this fear that if they're lifted up, then we will be pushed down. We live towards people generally with a kind of scarcity mindset. If they are celebrated, then I'm not. But David doesn't have a scarcity mindset. He has an abundance mindset. And the reason that he can have an abundance mindset is because he knows the abundant goodness of God. He knows that the goodness and the approval of God is not so small and limited that he has to fight for it, to strain really hard at being recognized. And he knows that God's view of him can never be changed. So he really just stands up and says, weep for Saul. Saul was wonderful. I miss him. You can only stand up and speak about your enemy like that if you know the abundant, overflowing, never-ending love of God. I wonder whether we have that kind of mindset. I was to be really honest with you, I, I don't always celebrate the goodness of others. There are many, many moments in my life where I feel bitter because somebody else has had an opportunity or they've been lifted up and praised. Sometimes I find myself secretly just wishing it was me that was up there, me that was being celebrated. You might relate to that. Sometimes I have a scarcity mindset. 
I do wonder whether that comes partly from living in a world that is always setting us against each other. Out there, outside of these doors, you never match up. You're always told to keep chasing and chasing and chasing to get to the top of the ladder. We're constantly led to compete with one another. The reality is it's hard. It's hard not to internalize that. The good news for us is that because of Jesus, we can live in God's abundance. The Apostle John in uh, the intro to his gospel writes this. He says that through Jesus, we have received grace upon grace. So put simply, it means this. There is enough of God to go around. The kingdom of God is not a scarce resource. It's not limited. It's not first come, first serve. It's an abundant kingdom. And if we continue to live from a place of scarcity, kind of hoping to gain favor before God and pip the person next to us to God's favor, we're going to become better people. We're going to become better when we see the person that we don't think is deserving being loved and favored by God. We'll find ourselves crushed as we work harder and harder and harder to be one of the deserving few that God loves. But when we live like David from the infinite goodness of God, from the well that never runs dry, we can be secure. We can be secure knowing that God will never ditch us for someone better. David, God doesn't look at you and think, they'll do for now. But soon enough, somebody better is going to come along and I'm going to move on. That might be what you've been used to in life, but God's love is not like that. When you know that, you can be like David who celebrated and lift up, lifted up those who were actually in direct competition with him. It wasn't in David's favor to talk about the goodness of Saul. We can admit our faults and celebrate others knowing that the abundant grace of God is ours. So that's number one. True power is abundance, but true power is also Humility. I recently uh, watched two uh, YouTube videos of two separate kind of high-level Premier League football managers talking about their leadership styles. And I was fascinated because they said the opposite advice. They both were asked something like, what do you do when you don't know the answer? And uh, one of them said that his players need to know that he is always in charge. So he never says the phrase, I don't know. He just makes something up and says it with confidence. And they continue. Struck listening to the other manager, he said this, I'll quote, he said, true leadership is having strong people around you with a better knowledge in different departments than yourself, not acting like you know everything, but being ready to admit, I have no clue. I was fascinated because there's two of the highest level leaders in sport and they say the opposite things. So who was right? One of them always says, I know one of them frequently says, I don't know. <clears throat> well, the simplest answer <clears throat> from the life of David is that if you're a Christian, there is always one who knows more than you do. Have a look at verse one of chapter two. David has found out that his enemy is dead. He calls on everyone to cry and mourn with him. And then his first step, verse one, he inquired of the Lord. And that little phrase is the very heart of what it means to serve as a follower of Jesus, what it, what it means to be somebody who loves God. Here's what David understands. He might now be in power, but at his very best, he is a deputy prime minister in God's government. At very best, he has a supporting role in what God is doing. God is on the throne. David is just his servant. All of David's knowledge and competence pales in comparison to the wisdom and the insight of God. And at this moment in David's career, he probably has hundreds of voices vying to get his attention, whispering in his ear, go there, go here, do this, do that. But David just hushes the voices and he only seeks out 
one voice. We started the book of 1 Samuel with the prophet Samuel being called by God. And he's in bed and he, he hears God wake him up and he says, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Well, here we are at the beginning of the second chapter of our story. And David says much the same thing. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. You know, the, the imagination of the writer of First and Second Samuel, true power isn't found in pretending you know the answer. It's found in humility, in listening to the voice of God, not the voice of yourself. I am... Um, used to have a, a counselor that would always ask the same question over and over. Anytime I would say anything, <clears throat> it got a bit annoying. She would say, whose voice is that? I said, when you say that or think that or do that thing, whose voice are you listening to? And actually, that's a helpful question for us as we go about our Christian lives. Whose voice is that? For many of us, the strongest voice is our own the uh, author, Alan Noble, puts it this way. He says, the fundamental lie of modernity is that we are our own, that we belong to ourselves. He goes on to reason that if we are our own, then we bear the full weight and responsibility of giving our lives meaning and purpose. We bear the full weight of leading ourselves in the direction that we need to go. It's a destructive lie. Living only for and from yourself leads to what you see all around you every day. Anxiety, feelings of inadequacy, competition, comparison. In the words of the book of Proverbs, there is a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. Our attempt to position ourselves as the masters of our own life, the, the one whose voice ultimately matters, has completely failed. So the solution then in the minds of the writers of scripture isn't just to give up, stop listening, stop trying to find <clears throat> joy. The solution is to relentlessly pursue the voice of God. Do you know that the voice of God created the universe? At the sound of God's voice, the stars stay in place. What comes from God's mouth is always true, always good. And the voice of God, the word of God, says the New Testament, is the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ. He's the word of God with flesh on God himself become man. And if Jesus is the voice of God, then to be like David is to follow Jesus. In Jesus' life, he went up a mountain with three of his friends and he suddenly looked to them like he has always looked for eternity. He was shining bright. His followers got a glimpse of his real godly nature. And as he did that, a voice boomed from heaven and said, this is my son. Listen to him. Listen to him. Because he is the voice of God. And at his words, storms were calmed. Demons were cast out. Sicknesses were healed. Dead people were raised back to life. Sins were forgiven. When God speaks, life comes. If listening to yourself ends in death, then the book of Proverbs goes on to say that listening to God brings about life. It goes on to say this, in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Listen to the voice of God. It's the second lesson that we glean from David's early leadership. True power is not found in pretending you know, but in saying, I don't know, but God does. I don't know, but God does. True power is to relentlessly pursue the voice of God. David hears God's voice and he heads <coughs> to Hebron. In verses two and three of chapter two, he builds a home there. And then in verse four, 
the people of this one tribe, Judah. They appoint him king over them. And what he does next, his first move as a newly crowned ruler, is the last of our observations about power. His true power is love. Have a look again, if you would, at chapter 2, and uh, we'll read from verses 4 uh, to 7. It says this, The men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. They told David it was the men of Jabesh-Gilead who buried Saul. David sent messengers to the men of Jabesh-Gilead and said to them, The Lord bless you, because you have shown this kindness to Saul your Lord when you buried him. Now may the Lord show kindness and faithfulness to you, and I will also show the same goodness to you because you have done this deed. Therefore be strong and valiant, for though Saul your Lord is dead, the house of Judah has anointed me king over them. You might remember, or you might not, that months ago when we were in 1 Samuel 11, <clears throat> there was a small town called Jabesh Gilead, and Saul, who had just become the king of Israel came to their rescue when they were in a lot of trouble. And this town just pops up again here. And it seems like whether we remember that far back in the story or not, that they have remembered Saul's protection of them in one of the few fine moments of his kingship and it means that they're actually now quite loyal to him. So it's these people, Jabesh Gilead, that David finds out have come and buried Saul and honored him after he's died. So what you have is a group who owe a lot to the last king. They've buried him. They still have a lot of love for Saul. David might be thinking, this could become a bit of a thorn in my side. Like this could become an issue because they still love Saul. <clears throat> so he sends some folk over with a message. Now, like we... We might think that message could be any number of things. It could be like a stern warning. I know that you loved him, but things are changing. Get in line. It could be genuinely just, I'm going to punish you. Punish the first one that disagrees with you, and then no one will do it again. We see something totally different in the way that David leads. He sends them a message of blessing. He sends them a message saying, because you have been good to Saul then God will be good to you. And because God will be good to you, then I will be good to you as well. See, David is showing us something of the kingdom of God. It's a kingdom of grace, not punishment. The kingdom of God is one of mutual blessing and kindness, not cursing and bitterness. Hebrew word for kindness here is <clears throat> hesed. That is this like central word if you read the Old Testament. It's, it means something much more than kindness. It means steadfast love or committed covenant faithfulness. Psalm 136 says that God's hesed endures forever. Psalm 23 describes the hesed of God as this relentless pursuing force that will never leave us alone. It's more than kindness. It's a complete commitment to somebody. So David looks at those who are on the side of his political enemy and he extends God's hesed love to them. I don't know if you remember a few years back when uh, one American politician called her opponent supporters a basket of deplorables. That is the norm in the world. Just speak ill of those who oppose you. Just tear people down. The way of God's kingdom is not to create these little roving bands of kind of ideological purity where we just cast everyone else out all the time. It's to multiply the kindness of God to those that aren't like us. David doesn't say to Jabesh Gilead, well, you're a basket of deplorables. He doesn't call them a basket of deplorables. He calls them blessed. This is one of the most famous teachings of Jesus himself. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Often the most that we manage is kind of tolerating our enemies. 
call of the kingdom of God is not enemy tolerance, it's enemy love. Now, we're 21st century people, so the word enemy might seem just a bit out there and extreme. Uh, But let's think about it this way. Who would you absolutely not want to have around for dinner tonight? Who do you think of when I say that someone has hurt you and shown you no remorse? Who do you just have no time for? The person that's in your mind right now, God loves them. And is calling you today to share in his committed love and faithfulness towards them. So when we show that kind of hesed love, it's contagious. When we forgive those who have harmed us and give to those who would take advantage of us, when we show compassion to people who have no time for us at all, that is contagious. And it declares what God is like. Here's a challenge for you this week. How will you go beyond token gestures of Christian niceness that really is just passive aggression? How will you actually love your enemy? How will you be proactive in extending God's compassion to people that annoy you? The reality is those are not kind of tertiary questions. If we take Jesus at his word, they are utterly central to what it means to live a life in God's kingdom. There's number three, true power is loving your enemy. Here's the reality. We're going <clears> to <throat> spend the next few months in Second Samuel. We're not going to spend every week saying, look how great David is. We catch a glimpse of him doing well this week. He kind of, you know, he's humble and he's abundant and he's loving. That isn't going to last long. We'll see him sin. We'll see him be abusive. We'll see him utterly fail to live the way that God wants him to live. Good news for us is that David is not where our hope lies. As we go through our series, we're going to see a promise of another leader. Another leader who will not fail or sin. Another one who will perfectly embody everything that David gave us a glimpse into this afternoon. We'll find out as you read through the Bible that his name is Jesus. And he perfectly, completely embodies the abundant humility and love of real power. So before we turn to worship again, I just want to finish like this. Let's lift our gaze from how we might live like David to the truly powerful one. The beginning and the end, the eternal Son of God, Jesus Christ. First, Jesus is the truly humble one. The one who obeys the voice of God perfectly and totally. David asked God, where should I go? He defers the decision of where he should live to God. So does Jesus. But for Jesus, he didn't travel from one town to another town. No, at the voice of God, Jesus left heaven to move into earth. To paraphrase Paul's letter to the Philippians, Jesus being God himself, instead of clinging to that power, he left it behind and became a man. He lived a life of relative obscurity. For most of his life, he was just a joiner. And then, facing death on a cross, sweating blood in the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus said this. He says, God, not my will, but your will be done. Jesus is the truly humble one, the one who completely deferred to God in humility. David went to Hebron at God's word. Jesus went to the cross at God's word. Jesus is the truly abundant one. John chapter one says this about Jesus, that he came to his own people, but his own did not receive him. Have you ever thought about this, that God himself walked around and people ignored him. People just didn't think anything of him. He walked around and he didn't get praise. He got threats and suspicion. If that was me, I would be screaming from the rooftops, don't you know who I am? And yet Jesus 
Instead of saying that, said, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. Jesus shows us real power when he gives it away, when he spreads it around, when he lifts up others and serves them instead of himself. And Jesus is the truly loving one. David says some nice words to his enemies. Jesus goes to a brutal, torturous death on a cross for his enemies. Jesus hung and died to save the very people that nailed his hands to the cross. Jesus is the friend of sinners. Do you know that? He's not the begrudging savior of sinners. He's not the kind of frustrated taskmaster of sinners. He's the friend of sinners. In the words of Thomas Goodwin, Jesus' love covered over in flesh. Or in the words, or the language of our passage today, Jesus is hesed, faithful, unrelenting, covenant love, covered over in flesh. Where David kind of extends blessing to his enemies, Jesus becomes a curse for his enemies and turns them into his friends. In verse seven of chapter two, David kind of sneakily calls the other tribes of Israel that haven't yet appointed him king to follow in Judah's steps. Come and crown me, he says. Look at what Judah have done. And you will pick up next week and we'll see what happens in what is seven and a half years from this point to when it actually happens. But the passage today ends on a challenge. Will the rest of Israel follow the abundant, humble, loving one? Same question remains for us. Jesus is the truly powerful one, the King of kings and Lord of lords. The very last page of the Bible, Jesus stands up and he says this, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The challenge that faced the rest of Israel faces us too. Will we follow the abundant, humble, and loving one? Will we crown Jesus as king?